We're live, guys. Welcome back to Ivan on Tech. Today we're here with with Simon Dixon, and uh, Simon we bring on every time there is a catastrophe. We discussed Celsius a few months back, and guess what? We're back. Now it's even bigger. Now it's even uh, more contagious in this industry. So we're going to discuss FTX. We're going to discuss the bankruptcy. We're going to discuss everything there is to it. But Simon, for people that don't know, please introduce yourself very briefly. Yeah, so um, I spoke at the first Bitcoin conference in the world. Um, I wrote the first published book to include Bitcoin in 2011. Um, and I'm an investor in over 100 different companies in the industry and co-found banktothefuture.com, uh, which allows people to co-invest in the equity of companies. Um, and that's how I ended up in Celsius, because we did a funding round uh, for Celsius for shares in their company. And looking at what has happened with FTX, I mean, it still blows my mind. It it's almost uh, makes me sick because this guy was so trusted with politicians, with everyone, with the media. Everyone loved him. So trusted guy. And, and, and here we are with a massive scam, the biggest, maybe the biggest in the industry. Uh, so how did you learn it? Like, w w when did you hear about it first? Like, do you remember the, pl the place? It's kind of, you know, when you, when you have these big events happen, you often remember where you are. Uh, and what happened to you when you heard the news for the first time? Did, did that happen to you as well? Uh, because that happened to me. And uh, yeah, what do you make out of it? What happened? Yeah, actually, um, we were a very quiet voice in the Celsius community because really early on, um, the community at Celsius started to get suspicious behavior on FTX around shorting, naked shorting the sell token. Um, and uh, there was actually like this whole uh, sell short squeeze movement, which I refused to engage in um, because I thought it was a, it was a losing battle. People were going to get wrecked and they did. Um, and I don't want to be done for market manipulation because all of this is going to end up in court. Um, and Simon, plus one I second. Never short anyway. There is something wrong with your camera. I see people rising. That is, it's fro it is frozen for me uh, as well. Uh, but but it's okay. We we can continue like that as well if uh, if you can not fix it mm. somehow. Okay. Uh, but yeah, guys, uh, as 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 Simon said, already in the Celsius times. Uh, the community, the Celsius community, started to suspect something wrong with FTX, and there, there were all of these rumors that FTX somehow uh, manipulated the price of uh, Celsius, and, and somehow that FTX uh, was was part of the Celsius co uh, collapse. Um, and uh, this, this is what you're saying, Simon, right? That it, already at that point, yeah, uh, we'll do it. We'll do it voice only if it's not too distracting, because um, I think yeah, I'm just a still image fine. for some reason. <laughs> Um, but uh, yeah, so it was the Celsius um, community that first led me to believe that SPF was a bad actor. Um, and so uh, if you look back at my tweets, um, I started tweeting directly at him and asking him uh, if he is naked short selling um, the sell token. Um, and also whether he was going to predatorily try and buy all of our assets at Celsius because we were using the bid process in order to give everyone their coins back. So we were going to buy a bid for Celsius, give everybody their coins back, um, and then give everyone equity in all of the different assets that were illegally purchased with our money. Um, and because of Bank to the Future, we have that platform. We're able to distribute equity to everybody. Um, and so we were working away at that. But then um, it became apparent that FTX was frantically going around um, trying to buy all of the companies for pennies on the dollar um, and, you know, painting himself as a white knight. But when we went to, when we look back at those transactions, we started to notice that actually um, the bid that uh, FTX was giving for Voyager was simply a mechanism for wiping out his own debt and hiding stuff. Um, and uh, Almeida was also the number one creditor at Celsius. And so we started reverse engineering all these transactions and realized um, that it wasn't just predatory activity. It later turned out when we understood more about FTX that this was actually trying to hide fraud. Um, and so the Celsius community were ultra skeptical of SBF. And, uh, you know, and uh, I managed to get him to reply to one of my tweets. Um, and uh, from then on, he never replied again. And he started blocking everyone. Um, and uh, then we entered into the phase where, uh, you know, where we actually started to find out what was happening, which is around the same time everybody else uh, found out. 
So basically, we've had a lot of uh, companies going bankrupt in the in the last months. So, for example, Voyager you mentioned, and FCX seems so strong because FCX was gonna come in and buy everyone and and help everyone bail out everyone. Uh, but you notice some fishy business there. Before we get into uh, the details, can you explain to us what is a naked short? Uh, yeah, a naked short is essentially. I used to work in market making, and uh, what we would do is we would. Um, we could go long or short, so it mean that we wouldn't have enough stock um, on the stock uh, to be to actually have a negative position. So we'd have to reconcile and find somebody that would be willing to lend us that stock because eventually you need to balance. You can't just um, you know uh, you can't just go short on the stock and bet on it going down without being it borrowing the stock from somebody else. So in the the, the same scenario happens in cryptocurrency with these derivatives exchanges. Um, they have the ability to, you know, allow people to go short, but it's not actually backed by somebody lending them that token. Um, and that's what's called a naked short. And in the stock market, it's completely illegal. Um, in the cryptocurrency market, um, I'd still classify it illegal, but we don't have all these um, types of rules defined as we do with securities markets. Yeah, so, so normally in order to... But it to allows short, you, you to, to manipulate a price and, and contract the price further down. Um, not based upon market forces, but based upon fraudulent activity. Yes. So normally when you short, you have to borrow the asset, then you sell it. And then if the price of the asset goes down, you can buy it back and you can repay the loan uh, cheaper and, and profit the, the difference. And here, what Celsius community has noticed that the price of Celsius is going down a lot, is getting pushed down by uh, FTX. But because you could see that on the, in the FTX order book, or how did they know that this is uh, FTX that is uh, pre uh, suppressing the price? Yeah, the reason that they knew that was because 95% um, of all the token supply was locked in the app in, in a Chapter 11 bankruptcy proceeding. So it, it can't be moved and it can't leave. Um, and then they started to notice that more than the, the whole um, token supply um, was actually you know, being made available on the order books. And so they actually started to do, um, they started to try and short squeeze it by um, take buying up all the tokens, taking them off FTX and putting them in cold storage. And then they started to notice that there was this immovable force um, that was shorting further. Now, that could have just been people shorting because Celsius is in bankruptcy and it's a bad trade um, for the sell token, but it's a very small supply. Um, so they were studying the audiobook activities versus the known tokens versus the tokens that were stuck and locked up in the app. And the FTX at that point probably had issues themselves. Uh, looking at the timeline, it was just a few months back. Uh, so why do you think they suppressed the price of Celsius? Did they gain anything out of that? Uh, prolonged their their fraud? Or what is the motive there for them to suppress yeah. Celsius? So firstly, I don't necessarily agree. I started to share some of the evidence and the videos and the community um, put out there. Um, you know, it's not conclusive yet, but the, the, there's an examiner in the Celsius case, and now there'll be an examiner in the, in the uh, FTX case. Uh, the Celsius community were calling for the examiner to investigate the accounts on FTX. The funny thing is, is that will probably lead to insider investigations because the price of sell token was manipulated by the founders um, prior to um, all of this. And so those types of investigations can be used to figure out whether FTX was engaging in illegal activities, but also whether the founders of Celsius were manipulating the price using uh, FTX. So, um, you know, I don't necessarily, we don't necessarily know um, that, but there'll be examinations on all this stuff. Um, and so, you know, the conspiracy theory is that it was a coordinated attack to take down Celsius. So. If you look at what happened in Celsius, Celsius was an illegal hedge fund. It had a big hole. And so the founder, Alex Majinski, um, started taking our client money to manipulate the price so that they could fill the hole. Um, and then also started investing in things like a big Bitcoin mining operation fraudulently um, so that he could then take the company public and try and fill the hole. So what you notice is you get CEOs that are more and more desperate to cover their fraud um, and fill the hole. And so they start using client money. Now, the conspiracy theory with FTX is that SBF, also a bad actor, um, was essentially trying to take down these companies so that he could unwind some of the holes of the loans 
um, buy them up for pennies on the dollars, give all those assets to their shareholders against the creditors' interests, um, and then start to make up some of those holes. This is all alleged accusations, um, but this will all come out in the examiner reports throughout the chapter 11, um, and we'll get the, the absolute version of the truth. And how do you think this chapter 11 will, uh, will progress in comparison to Celsius? Because as far as I know, uh, FTX didn't have a lot of records of anything. It was, uh, it was no corporate governance. There was no real board, no real accounting, <clears throat> no real employees, no real financial reporting, uh, and yet so many VCs invested. Uh, so will that somehow affect the the bankruptcy procedures because there's a lot of evidence deleted uh, there, uh, i've heard that there are allegedly back doors in the system where uh, where the system doesn't even uh, log certain actions when it comes to trades so, uh, or, or or withdrawals i mean there, there is a lot of this where there's a lot of info that's not even there so what from what you've heard and the way you understand it how do you think this will differ from celsius uh, based on this data data missing yeah so we had similar things in celsius so the first examination report just came out um, and they showed that um, the custody service which is where you're meant to have client funds was co-mingled with the earn service where you're actually putting those funds at risk in order to generate yield um, and so those funds the, these systems weren't in these fast growth companies um, where they were going you know there's a one of the real telltale signs from this is who the hell is SBF and where did he come from, right? Um, he was just a, a 2018 person that came along um, and suddenly was propelled into massive um, status. Um, and a lot of these people came from the 2017 era, Alex Mijinsky, SBF, and they came from this era. So um, what we see is that when you grow that fast and you get into the billions and billions of assets under management, um, many, many, the, the, the fast growth is very hard to keep up with the types of, um, you know, and, and remember, they're all doing it illegally without the regulations as well. So rather than a segregated custody service, rather than a segregated security service for earn, rather than a segregated um, lending service with lending licenses, just complying with one of those things is a multi-year setup. It took us a decade to get all of the securities laws right um, to comply. Um, and so they grow this fast, they have that many assets under administration, they're not complying with any of those um, regulations. Um, and so there's many, many shortcuts in order to try and keep up with the growth. Um, so in the FTX case, um, you've got like 138 subsidiary companies. In Celsius, there was about seven. Um, all of those had to adhere to UK and US standards. All of these ones are multi-jurisdictional um, within uh, FTX. And um, so you're, we're, we're probably going to see the same, but it's going to take a lot, lot longer. It's going to be a lot more complex. You know, so this month alone in August, for example, the lawyers at Celsius spent over $6 million um, and just for one law firm, the, the unsecured creditor committee, $4 million. So they're spending about $10 million a month in legal fees just to try and unwind some of this stuff. That all comes from our claims as creditors. Um, you can only imagine what it's going to be like at uh, FTX. So they they found mm. about, I think, $1 billion in cash across all the different bank accounts. Much of the crypto has been hacked and gone. Um, so they're right, going to chew right. through a lot of that money um, to try and unwind this process. Um, it's going to be a long process. It's going to be a long ride. <clears throat> um, and FTX is infinitely more complicated than Celsius. Um, and plus, you know, there is more crypto left at Celsius, um, but we're, we're, started, we're unpacking all those. What we, what we found is the common pattern is that the CEOs, they tend to dip into client money in order to make investments. And depending on how those investments went and whether they're left with some shit coins or whether they're left with an unprofitable mining operation that needs about 200 million investment in the case of Celsius, um, or whether they're left with some private equity. So essentially, we're left with um, how did they spend their money? Were they a good investor? And can we distribute those assets to creditors? Yeah, from what I've seen, even in 2021, Alameda had a massive loss. And although it's 
theoretically should be different entities. I mean, everything is commingled. So if Alameda has a loss in 2021, where, like, how can you make a loss? You can have a monkey that picks coins and, and they had the God mode, allegedly, where they could um, see everyone's positions and they weren't even liquidated also from, uh, from what you see on Twitter because they were exempt from their liquidation engine. Uh, so probably there is not a lot left. And also the hack that happened right after the uh, uh, the collapse do, do you have any information on that what, what is, is it bahama government or is it uh, sbf himself like who who took the funds it's crazy in crypto here all these theories oh, everything from regulators took it to founder took it to it was hacked which one of these three do you think is closest to the truth um i think the closest to the truth and i don't know uh, i'm speculating just like everybody else um, is that it was an insider and a hacker connected to an insider. Um, so often most hacks come from the inside. And if you have bad governance system and bad controls, then you can guess that, um, you know, the funds were not spent on, on really implementing systems and controls in order to prevent certain backdoors being built. Um, and so normally you have someone on the inside that then gives information to a professional hacker um, and then they have some mm. kind of backdoor agreement. Um, you know, um, one of the people, uh, so Tiffany Fong um, was the person that leaked many of the employee leaks at Celsius. Um, and she's already had a couple of calls with SBF and SBF uh, kind of is, is uh, believing and, and in communicating with her that it's probably an inside job. Um, the regulator one is is a bit wild. I'd be very very I'd be very surprised if it if it went down that way. Um, if a regulator engaged in um, fraudulent activity through the blockchain, um, this one's going to come out, and uh, I'd be very surprised if it, if it turns out that way. But nothing surprises me anymore. Mm. Yeah, and can this be the biggest fraud of all times? Is, is it bigger than Enron and all the other big ones? Uh, well, Madoff uh, was, was bigger. Lehman Brothers um, was bigger, whether you consider that fraud. Um, and, uh, you know, we've got the CEO of Enron or the, the, the XM in charge right. of FTX right now. So we will find out um, that answer. Certainly the biggest one in, in the cryptocurrency market. Um, and, uh, you know, it's more extravagant, um, it's more crazy and it's more wild than anything we've seen in the past. Um, but also it's probably not the biggest one, uh, because we, it frauds definitely, um, but maybe not the biggest in terms of numbers and impact because FTX yeah. had its contagion, obviously, um, you know, the, the, all of the other companies, they, they had two exposures. One was when they had a token. Um, and people were, you know, collateralizing up their token. So in the case of Celsius, they were, um, they were allowing people to, uh, you know, receive sell token as a reward, borrow against that sell token. And then those DeFi DGENs were buying the sell token with the loan. Um, and then, uh, you know, allegedly uh, when the, the token was attacked, um, that created a weakness in the model. And they were representing the, a big chunk of their assets was the sell token. And so they managed to get these big high equity valuations at Celsius yeah. to dupe Canadian pensioners into investing um, and to dupe people into taking their retirement funds out of their accounts, um, which led to all this money backed by the belief that it was a $2 billion balance sheet, which was predominantly the sell token. It went to another level with FTX. Um, with FTX, in order to fill the hole, they actually posted all of these FTT tokens as collateral um, and so when uh, Binance uh, revealed the revelation that attacked the price of the FTT token, which took the whole thing down. Now, remember, um, many of the, the loans at, Voyage, uh, at Voyager and at uh, BlockFi, uh, their collateral was under collateralized and posted by FTT tokens. So then under collateralized and over collateralized becomes a question of the token price, which opens up a speculative attack which CZ from Binance um, essentially exposed. Um, and that led to the whole house of cards. So the first lesson um, is, you know, Voyager was exposed because they did under collateralized loans to three hours capital. Um, Celsius was exposed because they use their token as, as a rather than marking it to zero, they mark it to a very high price, then manipulate the price. 
um, and, uh, and then make under-collateralized loans to institutions and over-collateralized to retail. Um, and then FTX was, they took it to the next level where they essentially built a multi-billion dollar house of cards by posting FTT um, as collateral um, and then engaging in crazy risky activities, betting long um, uh, while trying to make the money up short. Um, so, so there's so many lessons here. Why do you think sophisticated investors accept these tokens as collateral? Because the whole idea is that I have collateral in case you go bankrupt, I have something that is still worth something that is not that, that doesn't go to zero together with you. But if you give me your token, you go bankrupt, this token will also go bankrupt. So it's not it's not a collateral even. How is it so that traditional investors, VCs, pension funds, when they look at the balance sheet, they don't question it? Is it greed? Is it FOMO in last year? How could they get away with this? Uh, I put it down to greed and ego. So ego, because these companies that print tokens, they want to become as big as Coinbase or someone like that as fast as possible. Everyone saw the Binance success story of what happens when you can print your own token. Um, and people want to get as far, the grow as fast as Binance and try and be as big. You know, Coinbase took the long route, which was just figuring out the regulations from 2011. Um, Binance took the fast route, which was print your own token and play regulatory arbitrage. And people keep trying to replicate those success stories. So, you know, Celsius wanted to be as big as Coinbase. So its strategy was um, offer no fees, do everything for free, um, print a token in order to have as, as much capital as possible, um, take riskier bets, tell people that it's low risk, tell it all, everyone that everyone else is a scammer and for charging you fees. Um, and just try and compete and offer the highest interest rates and present it as the lowest risks. So lots of people took that and, and deposited based upon that belief um, because it was just an ego play, I'd say, in that one. Um, the greed play um, is, uh, you know, just trying to get as fast as possible, print money. Um, you know, the, the Celsius was more of an investing culture, but complete misrepresentation skipping all the regulatory compliance and not having all the systems and controls. The FTX was the same one, but it was built by a trader. And a trader comes from a culture of fast returns um, and, you know, using risky bets in order to make money. Now, it's one thing doing that with your own money, doing that with other people's money and illegally doing it with client money. That's going to end you up in prison. Um, so then you have to buy politicians and you have to engage in all sorts of activities um, in order to try and cover up your fraud. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, it also can happen accidentally on so many you know, occasions. You end up with a small hole, you try and cover it up. Um, and what I've noticed with all of these CEOs is when the hole gets bigger and bigger and bigger, um, they come from a mindset of rather than doing what we did with Bitfinex, which is put your hand up, admit the hole, fix the hole, um, and use financial engineering, uh, they tend to come from a belief that they, a grandiose, narcissistic belief that they can fix it, they will fix it, and they carry on to the end. They're always looking for that last mm. chip. Give me that just one more chip and I can make it up. Give me that one more loan and I can make it up. Give me that one more shenanigan and I can make it up. And just a diehard belief until they're forced and dragged into chapter 11. Yeah, I understand why companies are incentivized to do the token. They want to replicate Binance, like you say, they want to become big. Uh, what doesn't make sense to me is how anyone in the right mind would accept it and give them funds. But Voyager gave, like you say, Vo Voyager gave capital without okay, any sorry, yeah, I forgot. to... Yeah? Yeah, I forgot to answer that part. Now, on the institutional side, you've got uh, you know, a, a competition to generate in the venture capital industry between 25 and 35% a year if you want to be on top of your game. Um, when people, when pensioners are choosing which fund, which venture capital fund to allocate capital to, um, they tend to do the, you know, the, they tend to do the lazy things of look at the highest performers in the last year. When you analyze the highest performers, they tend to have taken the highest risk and they're the lowest performers um, in the next year. So venture capitalists found this really easy way of competing with hedge funds. And they realized we're long-term capital. We can get free equity by going into the blockchain space where people will give us these favorable terms where we can increase our returns by pump and dumping the token 
um, and getting that free equity position, which then allows us to attract the most amount of capital. So essentially, the venture capital industry became hedge funds and venture capitalists uh, because they were given equity. They could invest in the equity and then they'd get the free token, engage in a pump and dump. Um, and so it got more and more extravagant the further it down. And if you had people with these huge reputations that came from top universities that sounded incredibly intelligent, that were politically connected, um, their due diligence mm. passed. You just didn't know that they were going to engage um, they didn't have, and the, the whole thing, if you really look back to it with these centralized companies, is we've seen all this before. We had it in the 1920s. Custody is a regulated activity. And just because it was crypto, they decided to ignore the regulations. You know, offering yield um, is, a, is securities. And if you complied with securities regulations, everyone would have known the risk and these would have been segregated. And lending is a regulated activity but they just decided the regulators were claiming we were telling you to comply, but you were ignoring. And also it's a regulatory failure because they were waiting for the companies to become big enough so that they could make the maximum amount of fines. Um, and essentially these exchanges engaged in the same tactic as banks, um, which is where commit crime um, and the fine is less than the profit of the crime. Mm. Yeah. So greed basically. It's it was the, it's all systemic. It was it was easy to show big returns. Uh, you do less due diligence because sounds credible. Everyone else is in. Uh, other big funds are in, so we're also in. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's that's what yeah. that that that's what bull market does to you. And it's crazy how quickly it can shift because in the bear market, no one wants to do anything. Kind of like right now. And in a few years, you have a massive bull run where the craziness is of magnitudes we cannot even imagine now. Because I remember in 2019, everything was dead. Like there was so little action in alts in anything. Nobody wanted to invest in crypto. No, nobody wanted to do anything. And then just some three years, two, three years later, we do see this kind of uh, greed and uh, and frothiness. It's uh, it's human psychology. It's fascinating. And in terms of what yeah. uh, what people that have funds on FTX can expect now. And by the way, for all you guys watching, know that I have a few ETHs there as well. So I'm very curious how you know what what is next. Do we sign up at some form? Do we? Uh, uh, is it the new the Enron uh, the Enron uh, person that uh, that's now uh, doing this bankruptcy that is. Uh, that is the one that is arranging all of this. Uh, how will it happen, you think, Simon? Yeah, okay. So I'm, I'm doing a, a video on my YouTube channel this Friday on exiting Chapter 11. I'll do an AMA as well. But briefly, the process from here, uh, which because we've been through it for the last six months, um, essentially um, everyone, the, the top 50 creditors, which are people that had money on FTX and that are owed money, they'll be published publicly. Um, and there's going to be probably about a million other creditors, which is all people that had money. Um, you're now going to be considered a creditor, which is mean that FTX doesn't have the money um, and they need to repay you. So you have what's known as a claim. Um, from here on in, there's going to be... But um, Simon, oh, Simon, uh, one question about that claim. Uh, the FTX website is down and uh, no one can log, log in there. And I, I also told my channel, listen, go in there, record everything, take all the screenshots. So I have all the screenshots, uh, and I think people that listen to me also have the screenshots. But if they wiped all the systems, and I don't know if they did, uh, ha like who is really there to ensure that the list is uh, full uh, of all creditors? Uh, because if they wipe the database, there is no trail, right? Yeah, so it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a tripartite process, um, Chapter 11. You have the, the company, which is the debtors. So the difference, you know, Alex Majinski held on for the last month, um, but SPF stepped down straight away. So you've got what should be an independent CEO in charge of the company. Um, and uh, so the, the company will be trying to unpack everything. Um, and they've put experts in, in unpacking fraud um, within the team. Then you have the Department of Justice um, represented by the U.S. trustee. And a trustee is to hold the data to account. Um, and then there will be an unsecured creditor committee, uh, which will be a committee that is due to represent the interest of you. Um, and those three people together will all, the, a judge will be appointed um, and all those three parties together um, and you and, and anyone can hire a lawyer and file a motion. Um, and so eventually the company is going to try and publish everything, do a whole report. Um, the, it's highly likely that the Department of Justice will appoint an examiner 
and that examiner will be able to subpoena data, subpoena data from SBF, um, and examine the whole thing. So it, it's going to be an expensive process. It's going to be paid for by anyone that had funds at FTX, um, and it's going to take a long time. And so that's the Chapter 11 process. But by the end of it, we will have a full examination report. Um, I guess whether there's political corruption in that process, we will see. Mm. Um, but uh, that is the process. We've been going through it for the last six months with Celsius, um, and it can continue for a, much, a lot longer with FTX. So buckle up, yeah, and please financially prepare buckle for not up. receiving those funds for a long time. Um, prepare for the fact that you may never see any of those funds, um, unfortunately. And uh, you need to manage your business if you've got the funds locked up. Um, you need to go into your own Chapter 11 if your business is exposed to FTX to a point that you can't fix. And you as an individual, you may receive some funds in the future, but you need to get ready for that um, eventuality. Now, what happens at the end? Um, this either goes in a few directions. One is that it's complete fraud, a Ponzi scheme, in which case all of the assets will be sold off in what's known as Chapter 7, liquidation which is where you just liquidate everything and try and get as much recovery for people and you get your pro rata claim based upon what data. If the data has been wiped, um, then there's a whole examination. Hopefully there's backup. They could go to web Amazon web servers, subpoena them, whatever they've got to do in the legal process. Um, then uh, you will get your pro rata. The other way um, is that... Um, the company goes into an auction and other companies like FTX was trying to buy Celsius, buy Voyager, buy BlockFi. Um, so it goes into an auction and that tries to recover funds for creditors. Um, and the final process, which I think is the most favorable, which we're trying to get right now, is um, a, a bail-in, which is essentially if there's enough assets in the company, um, then everyone should receive equity. And uh, we're building out a process so that everybody can receive equity in all the individual assets um, and then they can hold them for the next bull market because one of the problems we saw is that selling assets right now in the in two years before halving moving into christmas mm. in the worst financial you know uh, fraudulent catastrophe our market has seen um, is the worst time to be auctioning off assets so rather than allowing a bidder to like ftx was trying to do benefit from all that appreciation and fill their own hole um, we're trying to get it where everyone receives equity and they can fill their own hole. Yeah, and like you said on the Twitter space, I listened to this is the bull market for for lawyers. They gotta love this, and uh, I'm sure they will take their time and and be very methodical, not not uh, hurry too much. And uh, yeah, it, it's gonna be years. Uh, can this be longer than Mount Gox? Because Mount Gox was quite simple in comparison to this, right? But it was in Japan, uh, which is my understanding of partially why it's 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 so long. But you think it's gonna be longer than than Mount Gox, ten plus years? I don't think so. No, um, I'd I'd put I'd put a, I'd put two years on this one. Um, you know, just from the experience, Chapter Eleven is is a lot more um, faster process. Uh, the reason Mount Gox took so long was because um, it went into bankruptcy, um, and uh, you know it, it lost six hundred thousand Bitcoin, and then um, you know I think it was eight hundred thousand Bitcoin at the time. I can't quite remember. Um, then that was officially bankrupt, but then after the bankruptcy. Um, the price of Bitcoin made it where the dollar value of what it owed everybody went back into profit um, because mm -hmm. they didn't sell the Bitcoin. So it went into this new process because Mark Capellas found 200,000 Bitcoins under his bed in the mattress. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Those Bitcoins were worth more than the dollar value of the bankruptcy. So it went into a new process called civil rehabilitation. And in that civil rehabilitation, anyone that thinks they have claims on those Bitcoin um, can sue them. So this asshole um, came out and said, hey, I had an agreement with Mt. Gox, and uh, we were going to build the US version of Mt. Gox. So therefore, it owes us $16 billion uh, based upon the price of Bitcoin if we had built that business. And then every time it was going out to pay creditors, a new lawsuit would come through, which would delay the creditors getting paid for a year. And eight years on, we still they still haven't been paid. But it looks like it's coming to the end of that. So in Chapter 11, you get protection from all these lawsuits to figure out these issues as fast as possible. The professionals milk it. Um, and so you have to, using the Unsecured Creditor Committee, 
um, push against them trying to unnecessarily extend this process. Um, and anyone can join, by the way. If FTX owes you money, you can apply to be an unsecured creditor and engage in the results of what actually happens in this case. Yeah, and like you mentioned, the if you have a lot of money where it's worth to get a lawyer uh, to be in touch with this committee or to be in touch with uh, Department of Justice, who is who should, like you said, should represent uh, the creditors in some way also, or at least hold the company to account, uh, then it makes sense. Uh, but what it, what if you have uh, you know, 5K, 10K, like the lawyer doesn't make sense in that, in the, in that case uh, to, to, to do this process for you. So if you are a small creditor with a few thousand dollars, uh, like should you do anything or you, you just trust that you are included somewhere there in the process? I mean, because for many people, it, it, this, is, this is a lot as well, uh, it, you know, 10K, 20K, 50K, it, but having a lawyer can, can easily be most of that money if, if it is for two years and they have to be heavily involved. So uh, how would you say for, uh, if it's not worth getting a lawyer, is it, is it just that you follow along or you can do something yourself? Uh, what, what, what would you say to that? Yeah, follow along in Twitter spaces. So um, eventually communities um, break out into special interest groups. So what happened with Celsius is we realized there was a group of people that where they couldn't pay off their margin and they were liquidated unfairly. They didn't want to send money into the bankrupt estate. Others believe that they were entitled to, they were treated unfairly. So what happens is engage in Twitter spaces, which became the place or YouTube or wherever the community goes. Um, and eventually you'll start to unpack all these different special interest groups. Um, if you want to take a leadership role, set up telegram groups around these special interest groups. And um, that's what happens. People just naturally form into representing different groups. Um, and then those telegram groups were formed with thousands of people in the same situation. And they started crowdfunding um, to get legal representation so that they could file motions in court. Because you can complain and shout as loud as you want. And it's worth doing, um, you know, initially, um, but eventually, if it's not led with a lawyer filing a motion in court, then it's just it's just shouting, crying, and um, and trying to get attention. Um, so eventually, you have to coordinate. Um, and so, you know, I don't, you know, obviously, I can't give you legal advice, but uh, I think these groups will naturally form, and you can get together and you can engage with other people in similar situations. And really, the community is your support group. Um, you know, in the Celsius case, we, we had people that, that they took their lives. They were so devastated by this. Um, so really engage with the community, hang around with other people that are in similar situations. Um, and remember, you know, some of the most sophisticated of sophisticated fell for this scam. So if you are feeling that you, you made really bad financial decisions, you know, I've been involved in this industry from the beginning. Um, I still ended up with 45 million that ended up as 10 million you know, as a result of engaging in Celsius. So don't feel bad for yourself. I'm sure Ivan gets scammed all the time, even though he knows every scam um, under the sun. It happens to the best of us. Don't take it personally. By the end of this process, you're going to be a very, very wise investor. You're going to know more than the average investor that didn't go through this. Um, and then we get to rebuild and you get to rebuild your personal wealth. So it's never, ever, no matter how low you are feeling, it's never worth um, taking the most precious things in, in life. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. And this is what's crazy that you there are so many numbers, there are so big numbers, so so big um, number of people, so big amount of money that is lost, and sometimes you forget that this is like it's very serious. Uh, and uh, like you say, people are considering uh, taking their life. So it's uh, it's very important what you just said that uh, everyone will get through this, and uh, there is even a chance that it's. It's out to hodl. It's like in Mount Gox, they hodl for ten years. It's more than it was before, and uh, yeah, it could be like that with with FTX as well. Let's see. What's what's interesting and what scares me a bit is that you mentioned that fifty largest creditors are going to be publicly announced. So they better announce themselves before that in order to have some kind of plan how to deal with the public knowing about them, uh, because it could be actually it's other a bit changes. more than that, Ivan. Yeah, um, you have to fight for that. So in Voyager, they fought in court to um, anon the 50 will be 
Um, but everyone else, they had to fight to anonymize their names as a username. In Celsius, they published all of us. They published uh, we everything. We had to fight for them. <laughs> they published everything. We had to fight for them not to publish my, our personal addresses and our email addresses. By bankruptcy court law, uh, that's what you have to publish in normally. And the judge had to file, you know, we, we had to fight to make it. Um, but he decided our names were going to be published, uh, which is an absolute doxing nightmare. But... In the end, um, once you've accepted that that can happen, you try and fight for your privacy. But you know, once you've lost, which we did in Celsius, um, it actually turned out that we could then crunch all the data. We figured out that there were insiders that were withdrawing their money before the process because all of the transactions were published. Mm. Um, there were people that were just point blank lying, um, like uh, you know, one one. Um, you know, the, so like Alex Majinski's uh, wife said that she was a creditor, but she withdrew all her funds. Um, and, uh, you know, it, so all of that comes out. And then you all of the community that said, yes, I've got loads of money on here. You realize that they had no money on there or and it's um, it's a bit of a, a thing. So uh, make sure you're not caught lying because it comes back to bite you in these cases. Right. But. Is it by default that they're going to publish all uh, all addresses in the FTX uh, as well? Yeah, by default, they're going to publish all your data. Um, but you need the unsecured creditor committee um, uh, to represent you to try and limit that. Um, in the case of Celsius, credit where it's due, they fought hard to try and anonymize um, their clients' data. They really fought for the privacy. Um, so both the unsecured creditor committee and Celsius itself uh, were fighting for that. Um, but the judge said, no, we need to publish people's names. Nobody's receiving any money unless we publicly publish uh, the names of all those people. So there was a f like, like a, a 50,000 page document mm. uh, yeah, yeah. that uh, listed but what's everyone. The logic? And then people started to build websites. So, and then they started to index yeah. them in Google and all sorts of stuff. But what was the logic with that? Because there, there's uh, always some logic that, you know, it should be transparent, there should not be conflict of interest, everyone should know everyone else. Do you know the logic of being this, trans this public? Yeah, exactly that, because these people are going to have to receive money in the end, and we need to comply with anti-money laundering obligations. Mm. Remember, if insiders are doing fraudulent things with this money, um, then that is the proceeds of crime. And so all of that needs to be published so that everyone can, can chew through all of that data. Um, and uh, yeah, it, you know, in bankruptcy, it's normally, you know, like 10 people that are creditors, 10 companies. Um, but these are the first cases where it's like 600,000. And yeah, in the yeah, case yeah. of FTX, probably over a million investors. Um, so, you know, the process wasn't really designed for, for these things. Um, but in the end, you know, fight for it. Um, but in the end, it is also very useful to, to find out who all the bad actors are, um, who's lying, yes. um, and, uh, and who was working against your interest. Because, for example, there were people that in Celsius that they were pretending to be creditors. Um, they only cared about, they bought some sell tokens, um, and they were trying to represent like creditors, but they were just trying to pump the price of their sell tokens, and they weren't even a creditor. Um, and so you have all these shenanigans and you can catch people out and call them out. Um, so there's a plus and a negative, but obviously fight for your privacy. You don't want to be doxxed. Yeah. And what I worry about is that there are still big companies that haven't disclosed that they're affected by FTX. As with uh, Luna or Three Hours, everyone says, we're not affected, all good. And then a week later, withdrawals are halted. Uh, yeah, we're bankrupt. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> so now that the the creditors will be announced publicly, and especially the big ones, uh, do you think that uh, they will come out earlier and announce themselves to kind of own the announcement? Because you can you can own the narrative better if you come out yourself before and announce. Or do you think we've seen most of the contagion right now from FTX? Uh, no, I don't think we've seen most of the contagion. I think there's still boards that are trying to figure out how to fill their holes and what their communication strategy is, um, whether there's a reorganization they can do, uh, whether they can just reach out to their creditors direct and try and renegotiate a new deal. Um, but yeah, uh, get ahead of it. Um, once it's all published, um, then, you know, you, you there's, one thing I've learned from Celsius is you are naked in the middle of the sea and the tide is low. 
Um, we're moving to an ultra transparency world. You know, everyone's questioning all of their accounts. We've got proof of reserves. We've got everything. Um, I think the world that we live in is more of a, a self-regulation environment on top of the regulation because communities, are, after all of this loss, the communities are really smart. They know some, some, they know the right questions to ask now. And so we, we, we are all, any company engaging in the, in the cryptocurrency space, um, in the years ahead, even if you're not a public company, you're going to be held to public company uh, level of transparency and accounts. We're already preparing. You know, we've been a private company for a long time, but we're already preparing for what, what do we publish? How do we publish it? Um, because we're moving to an ultra transparent world with, um, with everyone holding you account. And it's the same with creditors as well. So if you're engaging in funny activities, um, you know, uh, we're, we're moving to that world, whether we like it or not. Yeah. And I think we really need to question this KYC regime we have right now globally. KYC could make sense if it's, it's protected against cases like this, where if I'm doing KYC, ideally, the exchange shouldn't just have some Excel file with everyone's KYC or a database with everyone's KYC. It's, it's a honeypot, especially now that we're moving towards more a regulated environment in Web3 Web and crypto, where you have the travel rule being implemented. And there are, all, there are also proposals to ensure that if you want to use your self, uh, uh, self custody wallet with an exchange, you have to also KYC. And uh, all, all of this is resulting in this massive honeypot of personal data being so vulnerable. And it can be through this bankruptcy procedure or it can be through hacks, through data leaks. Um, do you think there's any conversation about this on a global level? Because obviously KYC will never go away, but we need to do it better. It cannot be that you just send your passport with, uh, <laughs> with the current date smiling into the camera to some, to some exchange. Who knows how they store that data, but it's a must right now in, in, the, in the crypto space and everywhere else. Do you see any questioning of this, any discussions? How do we do KYC with privacy in mind? Because regulators like privacy, GDPR, Bank Privacy Act, there's so many privacy things that regulators do, but then we have all this KYC mess. And I'm not really sure how that is protected with all of the privacy concerns they normally have with data protection in the EU and in California and everywhere else in the world. So what do you think about this? Yeah, e, um, you're, you're talking about the conversation of all conversations. It's our personal data, our personal privacy, um, our personal security. You know, this is if they had published my address, I'd, I would I'd be moving house. That's it. Point blank. Um, you know, the, 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 these decisions are really, really important. But no, they're all going in the wrong direction. Um, EU were, led the charge with GDPR. Um, you know, GDPR was a real pushback and fight for privacy. It's not implemented globally. And even in the U.S. core, when we were, when we were fighting, saying there's European customers, you know, Judge Glenn said, I don't give a shit. You came to U.S. core. We're using U.S. law. Um, we're not, we're not, we're not bound by GDPR. So unless there's an international, you know, I'm really proud that the EU led that charge with GDPR, but unless the whole world starts to get on board that, my fear is that they're just doing the opposite. They're looking for, you know, central bank digital currencies. They're looking for um, automated tax collection. Um, they're looking for more aggressive anti-money laundering laws. Every time something happens, they see that as an opportunity to get more aggressive. Um, you know, SBF was lobbying for, um, you know, OFAC compliance within DeFi contracts and, uh, um, and uh, you know, on-chain, um, you know, KYC and all sorts of stuff. Um, so you're talking about the battle of all battles. And um, unfortunately, um, I fear that we're moving towards a communistic way of organizing um, economies due to excessive money printing, central bank digital currencies, um, and we're losing the battle for AML. Why? Because of tax collection. So when governments are broke, they're going to ask for more data. They're going to subpoena these exchanges. They're going to look for honeypots of money. Um, and uh, cryptocurrency was a great one for them to, to, to get to. Um, that battle is being lost. It's why that we need to really focus on not just the centralized token printing, but the real decentralized, which is money you can own, money you can spend, and money that has a fixed supply, which still to this day is proof of work and Bitcoin. And there is a coordinated attack against proof of work at the moment. You know, Ethereum has gone proof of stake. So 
now everyone's going to stake on exchanges and regulators will control it. Um, but the proof of work um, blockchain and the ESG narrative against it is probably the biggest fight for freedom that we'll experience in the in the in the decades ahead. And before we end the Simon, have you seen any FTX uh, communities? Because with Celsius, it was so clear. There was this, you know, sell, short squeeze uh, community. And uh, I saw some guy Curtis and like there were quite some people that were really passionate about it. Uh, with FTX, I haven't really seen an FTX community uh, because like we mentioned, if if um, you guys want to get involved in this process and be part of this telegram groups uh, you got to find them somehow so do you simon know where to where to go right now except for just you know following you in general and some twitter spaces in general um, ha have you have you seen anything form yet in terms of coordinated communities yeah no the communities haven't coordinated yet at the moment everyone's just trying to unpack the information so twitter spaces is where all the information is happening um, you know, I've been spending every day trying to give out information on Twitter spaces and everything. Um, but eventually it will be the interest group. So if the difference with FTX and Celsius is Celsius was, was 100% retail. You know, it was, um, yeah. it was people getting their retirement funds. It was individuals that believed in the token. It was, you know, 600,000 um, people that were left in the end and, and many, many hundreds of thousands withdrew. Um, but it was, it was the crypto community. Um, with FTX, there's a lot more institutional that had accounts there, hedge funds, companies that need to defend their own positions uh, before they come out and speak publicly as an individual. Um, so it's a slightly different um, type of community. Um, but there are tons and tons of people because, you know, everyone was promoting FTX. They were very aggressive. You know, they have billboards yes. on, on all sorts of stuff. So um, they will emerge and they will come out. I think everyone's just kind of listening for now. Um, the challenge with the companies is it may expose their own company to contagion, so they need to figure out their own comm strategy. And then if you go a layer up, obviously Digital Currency Group um, and Genesis, you know, uh, Genesis um, was uh, exposed to FTX, um, and uh, they're doing everything between their creditors. So who are, you know, Digital Currency Group creditors, essentially, you know, and Genesis creditors. Well, it's like circle. Um, you know, yeah, big yeah. companies, backdoor conversations, negotiations. Um, you know, it's uh, it's uh, these these different types of companies. So, um, eventually, all of these companies are going to have to transparently publish their exposure. It'll all be known. They're going to have to communicate, um, and you'll have these different types of um, public communication um, with community groups um, pushing against it. Yeah. So, I haven't seen coordination with FTX yet. It will come, it will follow, but it seems to be congregating around data gathering on Twitter spaces. Yep. So guys, follow Simon. Uh, you'll see when he's in different Twitter spaces. And uh, Simon, thanks a lot for being here yet again. If something else blows up, we're going to be back. Uh, and <laughs> like you say, there is a good chance, unfortunately, that something else will blow up as uh, we still haven't seen full contagion yet of uh, FTX. So uh, we'll be keeping an eye on the developments and uh, any final words to our community, where they should find you and uh, how they should get involved with what you're doing. Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, I'll see you in a couple of weeks for the Genesis Chapter 11. That's my next forecast. <laughs> Um, but uh, the the and there'll be more. There's the Block Five One coming, so we'll keep going. Um, but yeah, I've, I I publish all of my talks. Um, some of them are just hours and hours of AMAs, and others are just short form content on my YouTube channel, Simon Dixon, and um, on on my Twitter at Simon Dixon Twit. Um, every time I'm on a space, it will uh, blast through, um, and you can join that space. And I'm often up there as a speaker, just trying to. Is it, the real amazing thing is that we're discovering the data faster than traditional media. So the bases, and we were unpacking it in real time, um, and then two days later it would come out in the in the media as well. So um, Twitter Spaces is really becoming the media, and obviously you yes. get all the shit information and us discovering and fudsters and different agendas, <laughs> but we we try and unpack it as well as we can.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I listen in on them. It's uh, so yeah, definitely f follow Simon. It's and by the way, so this this whole FCX thing really got me to discover Twitter Spaces. Uh, before mm. that, I never really r really uh, discovered it or or, or uh, saw the power of it. But like you say, it's insane that uh, that there's so much alpha and so much information coming out there in real time. Yeah, and the, fir uh, the first Twitter yeah. Space that Elon came on was uh, one of yeah, ours yeah. when we were when we were covering FTX. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I was there as well with Elon and and CZ. So oh, cool. yeah, gr great, great work on that. I, I think in terms of media, this this collapse has uh, has uh, changed the media field for sure with uh, with Twitter Spaces. So guys, definitely try it because uh, for for a long time I also saw okay now there's a space there's this purple bar, but I never really clicked on it until the FTX things. So that's uh, that's definitely something for you to check out. On that note, we're ending the stream. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks a lot, Simon, and goodbye, guys. Goodbye, goodbye. Bye-bye.